So the question would be, what happens in 22? So another metric we've used is this $10,000 per acre benchmark. Uh, if you were in Iowa or Illinois, this might not be as important because they've had a lot of sales over the years in excess of 10,000, but in Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan, that's more of a benchmark number. And you can see that back in 2019, less than 10% of our sales were over 10,000 acres. 2020, we actually declined 7.3% over 10,000. In 21, the first six months, we jumped up to double, 17% were over 10,000 an acre. And then the second six months, 88%. So again, just evidence of that big jump in values that we talked about. So what's happening in 22? Well, you can see that we have maintained or maybe even slightly increased through the first, and this, this chart is up to date as of last week's auctions. We had two auctions last week that would qualify as crop land sales for this chart. So you can see this is right through last week. Pat updated this for me. And you might suggest we're up toward $90 uh, with the most recent sales. Um, but clearly above the $80 mark. And if you were wondering what's happening in the first three plus months of 22, the farmland market continues to be strong and moving maybe even stronger. Not necessarily a surprise when you think about what commodity prices, corn, soybean, and wheat prices have done the last few months as well. And if you view U.S. farmland as a safe haven, obviously um, political risk has really come to the forefront when you think about what's happening in other parts of the world today. So here's the chart, the long-term chart. And so you look at that first five years that I just talked about, 2016 through 2020, a lot of noise, variability up and down, but basically if you put a flat line through the end of 2020, it's right there at that $50 mark. And then we saw the jump up to that $80. And for half of last year, we were right at 80. And then you can kind of see the jump up even higher here in the last couple of months. So the, the farmland market really underwent a dramatic shift uh, over the last six to eight months. And we would expect those trends to continue based upon the current economics and agriculture. Here's a whole list of sales. I'm gonna quickly jump through these, but I really wanna show you when this all took off. Uh, August of last year, we had four or five sales back to back to back to back, uh, multiple days, and they were all over 10,000 an acre, all in multiple locations. So that July sale there in the middle of this page in Hamilton County, throw that out. That's a development influence transaction. Hamilton County is the fastest growing county in the state of Indiana, population-wise. But Tipton County at 14.5, Noble County up in the northern part of the state at 11.2, and then White County over in the western side of the state at 10.7, Preble County, Ohio, east, uh, yeah, Western Ohio at 10.8. Those were four sales back to back to back to back that all went over $10,000 an acre. Then we had more of a recreational floodplain piece at 4,300, followed by one at, in, back in Tipton County at, at 15,000. And those sales just kind of continued all through the fall. And you can see that on these charts. And granted, we, we see sales as low as $3,900 an acre there in Lawrence County. That's subject to flood land uh, in the White River Basin down there in Lawrence County. South of so we show all these different kinds of sales, but uh, the cropland has done extremely well and has been extremely valuable if you have that to sell. Again, as I said at the beginning, tough to be a buyer. Um, easy to be an owner and enjoy your balance sheet improvement, right? So then we'll quickly jump and see we've had a lot of sales. I talked about volume being up and the volume certainly has continued and you'll, you'll see a number of sales here after we turn the calendar into 2022 and a lot of them in that five digit range, meaning $10,000 plus an acre. Uh, again, even the, the 7,800 there in Jasper County was at $66 a coffee point. You might say that was a little bit below market uh, for that, um, but I, I'm imagining there's some of those pieces that actually brought over 10 an acre, and when it was all average, that's what we found. Uh, but again, that's what makes every sale unique, and why when you want, if you want an evaluation on your property, you might want to contact a Halderman representative um, because the values do vary quite substantially. Here are the sales right here in March, just uh, last month, and then the two sales that I referenced last week. Uh, here in April, and again, showing the continued trend. So you can go onto the Holderman app. I left this in here just in case you wanted to look at that. Uh, you can go to that app and keep up to the minute on our sales. 
Uh, here is a survey. Now, this is new information as well. So you've not seen this. Uh, this is a survey I did of all of our staff as of March 1st. Now, we just showed you hard factual data. This is an opinion survey again. But you can see the range of improvement in values for best cropland, average cropland, woods, rural residences, the whole bit. Every segment of the rural landscape stronger, some to much bigger degrees than others. Uh, but certainly you can see some, some of our people felt like farmland was certainly up that 45 plus percent uh, year over year. Who are the buyers? And this shows data here in 2022. Still a majority farmer buyers, but the investor is heavily involved in this mix. I find that interesting because we're looking at cap rates today that are down around two and a half. And yet the, the investor is still very interested in buying farmland. And I was at the Global Ag Investing Conference about 10 days ago in New York City. And there are certainly a lot of folks looking to invest in U.S. farmland uh, from all over the world uh, because of limited uh, political risk. Uh, believe it or not, there were people that were investing in Russia and Ukraine uh, and own farmland over there. So that's where that, where I commented earlier, political risk has come to the forefront in some of our discussions. But farmer remains the majority buyer, uh, and the farmland investors, not necessarily for us institutional buyers, these are probably just individuals uh, that come to our auctions, maybe they're 1031 exchange buyers as well. Number of sales compared to previous years, you can see that we did see an increase this winter and our staff felt that and, and shared that in their survey. Dominant purchasers, now this is all sales. So the statistics I just showed you at 55.45, those are our actual transactions. This is actually our, our feel or our sense of the overall marketplace at 65.35. That would represent some of those off-market transactions. Now I, I've talked about this in the past, but it's the Purdue Ag Barometer. Purdue does this in conjunction with the CME Group. Survey 400 farmers from across the United States, not just Indiana, but all over. And they want their opinion. They want their feel. You know, what do you think about the agricultural economy? And this has not mirrored what farmland values have done over the last six or eight months. And you can see the last here, this report just came out about a week ago, 10 days ago, the beginning of April at 113. That's relatively low when you look at this chart historically. So it would suggest that farmers are feeling some negativity because of higher input costs, because of limited access to inputs, because of the projection and the actual increase of interest rates. So those things are factoring into the sentiment out in the agricultural sector. Hasn't factored into farmland values yet, but at some point in time, this negative attitude might. Will inflation be a factor? I've shown this chart uh, for probably three or four months, uh, but you can see that if we get into periods of elevated inflation, that's where we are today, farmland tends to perform fairly well in that. It is an inflation hedge, and that's the way a lot of investors look at it, and therefore part of the reason why they're interested in investing in farmland. And here's another way, uh, you know, when you, you know, real farmland prices exceed old record high, that was my comment that we are over, in fact, if you factor into inflation, uh, nominal values at their peak, and then you can also see values when they're adjusted for the PCPI. So farmland debt, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. You, we've talked about this before, but farmland debt is close to you know, it's come down over the last couple of years, but it's still at or close to the all-time high. These are inflation-adjusted dollars. So that's why it doesn't go skyrocketing well above what, where we were in 1980. But inflation-adjusted, we're back right where we were. Real estate debt is higher. Non-real estate debt is a little less. The key is that our average interest rates are very low. Now, they've come up about 100 basis points. So 1% increase in interest rates over the last three or four months. Of course, the Fed is looking at multiple rate increases over this year, so I would expect them to move higher from this point shown on this chart. But this has been a key factor in why uh, the debt level, even though it's high, hasn't been a, an overhanging um, barrier to people buying land. And here's a better way to show that. This is debt versus interest expense. So the debt is that gray blue line, the overall debt back at, you know, inflation adjusted back at the all time high, but the interest expense, that orange line remaining fairly muted because of the low interest rates. 
Here's the farm solvency ratios through the end of last year. And you can see a debt to equity and debt to asset ratio, no real concerns there. Shouldn't be, right? With the farmland values escalating as fast as they are and debt, while it's still closer at the all time high, um, the average asset values are up substantially from that all time high. So therefore the low debt to asset and equity ratios and compared to back where we were in the 1980s, looks pretty solid. Here's that other uh, tool that I've talked about, debt to income. So take the total farm debt divided by the farm income. Did jump up a little bit at the end of last year, but still well below five and a half. That 5.5 figure is kind of where it becomes a concern. Uh, we were there back in 2016, but then that has eroded the last four or five years. And at 4.1 is, is not a concern at this point in time. But that's something to look at and say, you know, if that continues to increase, then it might become a concern. And then here's this, the uh, delinquent loans, basically right at the, the baseline over the last uh, 20, 30 years. So where do values go from here? Really, uh, as I've said for years, farm incomes, interest rates, and supply. And we've got some changes in those. So we had really good farm incomes, 20, 27, 20, 2017, 2013, golden era, a lot of cash generated. We know about that. Then incomes dropped. And that was a big cash drain. And we've talked about the erosion of working capital down to where I think we were around 12% where we had been as high as 40%. So that was becoming a real concern. But we had a lot of government support from market facilitation payments to COVID from 2018 through 2020, kind of bridged the cash drain gap. And then we saw really good incomes last year. In fact, there were some probably some farmland operators that made three, four, five hundred dollars per acre last year. So government support, while critical through 2020, wasn't a lot in 21. Um, interest rates remain low throughout, but they are now increasing. And then the farms for sale were below normal. That has increased back to a more normal number this winter. So there are some changes in those three bolded topics here. We'll talk about them here in a second. So farm incomes. They're up, but there is a projection of a decline in 2022. The reason that would be is the higher input costs. Fertilizer, pesticides, seed, tractors, and rents have all moved up, and supply chain issues do exist. So there is a projection of a decline in incomes over last year. But if you look historically, there are pretty elevated levels. Impact to USDA payments, and I'm not going to spend a lot of times on these, but I have said this before, 2020 was an all-time high in government program payments. I've not seen the 21 numbers, but they're going to be substantially lower than this. Uh, and then again, these are inflation adjusted. But the key, when we talk about cash generation, you would look at this chart and say, if I look at the top of each of those bars, they're kind of moving up to the right. But if you take out the direct payments, farm income actually was flat throughout that time period through 2020 last four or five years. And then here it is when you had inflation adjusted, net cash farm income actually was in a uh, rate of decline until last year if we take the government program payments out. So that was key help, key bridge to get through that cash drain. Impact to trade, obviously this has uh, been a, a pretty dominant uh, number over the years. And the sale of soybeans to China continues to be a, a material and the, and the 2021 numbers were fairly strong, both for soybeans and here are the corn numbers. And uh, that has been a big push in the commodity prices combined on top of some of the weather events globally uh, that have caused these higher uh, prices. And then the, I think the jump over the last uh, couple of months obviously have been has been Russia's invasion of Ukraine because Russia and Ukraine together are 25, 30% of the world's wheat export market. Ukraine is 13, 14% of the corn export market. So the real concern is where will those exports come from if they don't come from those countries? And will the US have to make up some of that? And that's clearly been bid into some of the prices that we've seen for corn and soybeans, in addition to the drought in South America back in the middle of winter and demand globally for those commodities in general. Here's the other concern, it's the uh, corn fertilizer expense. You can see that trending much higher back to an all time high level. And I would say that's even higher if you take the prices here in the last couple of months. Again, Russia and Ukraine supply a lot of potash. 
and a lot of our nitrogen fertilizer. And so you see those uh, prices going up as a result of that conflict. And here's a percent of budgeted revenue. That percentage doesn't show as big an increase because revenue is up uh, pretty substantially as well. If we hadn't seen the corn and soybean prices jump up as much, this could be a much different presentation today and very negative uh, because of the higher costs. Timber values, we've talked about this before, but they've continued to move up with the housing demand and the boom that we've seen. That's not a surprise. And that does impact in the Indiana, Ohio farmland values because that is another part of our rural uh, countryside. We talked about cap rate and you can see at the very tail end of this, this is cash income divided by sale price. And we've hung at 3% for a number of years. I think when this survey comes out in here in June or is done in here in June, we're probably looking at that to, that tail to drop even further over on the far right hand side, down to probably two and a half percent. That would not surprise me if we get down to two, maybe two and a quarter even, because that's the reality of the marketplace today. So cash rents. I did do a survey with our group back in the first of March. And what did we see the results of 22 cash rents? These are actual results from farms we manage, it's higher. And, and we talked about that just a second ago that rents were up anywhere 12 to 20, 20 to $50 per acre. So pretty substantial increases, which if you recall the fall of 20, when we negotiated rents for 21, we did not know what commodity prices were gonna do in the 21. And had we negotiated a lot of rents in March, which we wouldn't wait that long on farms we manage, we probably would have reflected a bigger change for 21 and maybe less of an increase for 22. Uh, but a lot of catch up was done for 2022 and therefore we Was there more, less, or the same amount of farmland for rent? So this is supply. And so actually you saw some tenants give up farms this year because of the higher rents or maybe the higher cost structure. And so we did see a little more supply out there, but we also saw more demand, which there should be with higher farm incomes. Did you have any tenants in distress? We did have one representative with a tenant in financial distress, believe it or not. Did you try to implement any more flex or hybrid custom leases? Really, most of our cash rent leases are already on a flex. So we didn't see as many responses to doing that for 22 because we were already there. If you have a cash flex lease, one of the key elements to that is your base gross revenue number. You've got a guaranteed rent, and then we have the base gross revenue number that the farmer gets those first dollars off the farm. That number for corn had been hanging around $700 to $800 per acre, kind of in that range. You can see here, we've now seen it well over 1,000 for 2022. Why? Higher input costs. The same with soybeans. That number was largely around 550, $500, $600 an acre. Now it's as high as 800. So we adjusted those base gross revenue numbers up to accommodate for the higher input costs that we're experiencing out there. Base cash rents also moved a little bit higher. That's the guarantee the tenant gives the landowner. And then if there's some income above those base gross revenue numbers, it's shared with the landowner, maybe 25 or 33% of every dollar over goes to the landowner. Uh, but you can see even on the base cash rent, that guaranteed went up because of the uh, demand pressure that exists. And then here's the Purdue chart on, on land rents. It shows 2021 not going quite as high, back to the all-time high. I'm confident we'll be there when the 22 survey is done. So we'll wrap this up with a forecast. Obviously, long-term world demand fundamentals remain bullish for agriculture. You've got global food demand. You've got the need to feed people and, the, and a lack of maybe some production from a couple of countries that produce a lot of grain for the world. Uh, you've got that combined with the increase in demand for some biofuels here in the United States. Now, it's not hitting the actual market yet, this new soy biodiesel, but there's some plants under construction out in the Western Corn Belt that's going to demand more soybeans for biodiesel production. That's one of the things the industry is looking at, and that's getting factored into some of soybean prices today. Interest rates are still favorable. That's only up 0.02% from the lowest ever. This was the January report. I think when we look at the report coming out here in April, it will be up quite a bit higher uh, from the 4.03%. Sales picked up in the fall. 
it'll be interesting to see what this coming fall has to offer. I would suspect this summer will be somewhat slow like normal. And I would say there'd be very little government support program payments this year. And inflation. This has probably warranted a higher place on this slide. Uh, input costs rising, prices are up. Uh, I think corn and soybean prices were up pretty substantially at the noon hour today. Um, so it's, it's just a, a challenging time if you're trying to fight inflation. Low movement on my uh, computer here. So cropland values are in an uptrend. We also see stronger markets in timber, recreational land, rural residential, all those are moving stronger. Average to below average farms might be a little slower on the increase. Um, they're less desirable today because it's just harder to farm them uh, with today's larger equipment. So where do we go from here? Spring of 22, I, I would point out to you, we have profitable prices today. Seven plus dollar corn and $13, $14 soybeans are profitable. So that's bullish for agriculture. We have a low amount of debt to assets, low interest rates, but could they go up 2% this year? That's some of what the Fed is predicting. So will that have an impact on the bullishness that exists out there? Today, they're relatively low, but if they increase that much over the next six months, uh, could that be a little bit of a damper? Moderate supply of farms for sale, the biofuels, we just talked about that. You got population growth and the lack of maybe some trade from Ukraine. Uh, trade deals help us, certainly, and then the inflation factor. So those are all bullish factors in farmland values today. Um, some of them could change, uh, especially the interest rate uh, environment. Bearish, if you want to be bearish, you've got the pandemic. Well, Right now, Shanghai is basically closed down due to a COVID outbreak. China is, you know, their demand is a huge factor. We looked at that on the trade slide earlier. What happens if COVID really re-erupts with some other uh, variant? Um, that would be something that's kind of unknown at this point. We've been through a couple of variants so far and, and seem to survive them fairly well, but obviously that's uh, something to watch. U.S. and global production. Uh, We've got the reports out of how much corn and soybeans and wheat uh, farmers are going to plant here in the United States. You know what, what really happens, and I suspect that you know, with the wet, cold weather that we've, we're experiencing here in the Corn Belt right now, uh, there that's part of the reason for some of the price increases today is because not a lot of planting has occurred, much if any at all, in the northern part of the Corn Belt. What happens if the worldwide economy tanks due to conflicts? Think Russia, Ukraine, obviously that would lead to some lower demand. Biofuels, that's, that's a wild card today. Uh, right now it's fairly steady, but with E15 uh, and the president wanting to get that approved for year-round use, combined with the biodiesel uh, increases, that, that's still looking favor favorable, uh, but that could always change. And then interest rates increasing due to inflation concerns, and that's underway. It just depends how high it goes. And then... Interest rates have two effects. One is on the debt side, but also the other is this asset classes return. So what happens if CDs all of a sudden are returning 3% and yet your cash yield from farmland is two, two and a half? Does that change the investor attitude with regard to farmland? Working capital concerns are kind of over for now, but we're looking at the highest cost of production ever in row crop agriculture. So if we saw a decline in corn and soybean prices to below break even, that working capital could become a concern in the future. Uh, so something that bears watching. But as we wrap this up, we have very bullish fundamentals. You got higher prices, you got good demand for rental land, and that's going to equate to higher land values than that we have seen. So here's the expectations my staff gave me from March through September. Farmland higher, 10 voted yes, one said lower and two said the same. So that comes out on the bullish side of things, another two to 15% on top of what we've already seen. Rural residential lots, stronger to same, so a little flattening out. And we've seen that maybe in some instances in the, in the residential marketplace already. And then recreational land, still somewhat higher, but, but more votes on the same as well. So uh, that's kind of where our expectations are. I'm going to turn it back over to Nolan to introduce the Belltown team. All right. Uh, and we also have Clint, Teresa, and Vanessa joining us today from Belltown. And Clint, I think I'll let you 
do a little introduction for your team and uh, Belltown as well. Oh, you're muted, Clint, sorry. Thanks, Thanks. Owen. I thought I was on there. All right. Uh, as Nolan said, I, I'm Clint Johnson. I'm the Chief Development Officer at Belltown Power. And I have with me today my colleagues, Teresa Baker and Vanessa Ramirez. And we just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, solar power uh, development. So a few words about Belltown to start with. We're a solar power developer. Uh, we've been doing this for about five years. We got started primarily in Texas and uh, Pennsylvania. And since then we've expanded into uh, several of the Midwest states, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, uh, and now looking uh, a little further south into Kentucky, as well as out west into Idaho and Colorado. Uh, I think as of today, we've, we've signed up about 40,000 acres uh, for solar energy leases with, with landowners in those various states. And I think about uh, six or 7,000 of those acres are now uh, actual operational solar projects or solar projects that are in construction. And we hope to uh, have a couple thousand more acres uh, get started in construction yet this year. So it's moving pretty fast uh, in the solar power business. And we are every day looking to um, find more landowners who are interested in, in uh, talking with us about solar energy leases. So um, I'm, I'm here to, to answer questions. I think Nolan has a few. Nolan, if you wanna kick off. Yeah, sure. So we reached out and uh, got a few popular questions from different people that we had invited to the seminar. Um, and I guess one of the first ones that I have, Clint, is what is the big new push for solar energy? It's something that we hear a lot about with our landowners at Halderman. Um, everywhere we go, it seems to be a topic of discussion. So what is causing this big new push for uh, renewable energy? Yeah, well, there's a couple of drivers. I think uh, the, main, the main driver that really has seen solar take off in the recent years is just that it's now increasingly cost competitive. The price of solar panels and solar equipment has come down substantially. Now it's moved up a little as, you know, the cost of everything has moved up, as Howard's mentioned. Uh, so it's, it's a, but it is a lot more economic than it was say 10, 15 years ago. And so that's the primary reason. And of course there are also, um, there's, as you know, a, a lot of uh, movement to try to get more renewable energy uh, into the grid to replace um, you know, fossil fuels that are emitting more carbon. But I think that the primary driver really is around the economics. That's what makes it worthwhile. And that's what, why we're seeing it really take off. Sure, no, that makes sense, Clint. Um, and we, you know, we talk about leases a lot here at Halderman. Um, can you describe how a solar lease works? I understand there's an option period. Um, there's the actual lease period. Sometimes there's a construction period. Can you go over uh, the nuts and bolts behind those leases? Sure. And I, I'm sure a lot of folks probably know this, but just to, to back up and kind of start from the beginning here. So a, a solar energy lease is really like any lease, um, you know, as a tenant, Belltown Power or another solar developer would, would lease the land for the, the life of a solar project, which is typically about 40 years. And to start with, we sign what, what's called an option to lease agreement. So we would have about a five year period to uh, explore the viability of the solar project uh, before actually executing the lease uh, for the solar project. And during that option period, there's a typically an, an option payment that's made to the landowner. Uh, and then when the lease is signed, uh, we, we pay the full lease rate. And that, just to, to tell you a little bit more, that option period is really uh, to allow the solar developer to figure out whether it's gonna be possible to, to build that solar project. There's a lot of steps we have to go through. We have to get permission to connect to the power grid we need permitting often at the local level uh, or the state level. 
uh, and we need to do a lot of studies, environmental studies, engineering studies, et cetera. And those all take time, particularly the, the interconnection to the power grid. That takes a long time, several years. Uh, I'll tell you, if I could make that go faster, I would. Uh, but that seems to be the key driver on time scales right now. Sure. Um, now you talk about these leases. How much does a solar lease pay? A lot. <laughs> no, I, uh, <clears throat> I think that's something we'll, we'll let uh, folks come back to us individually. It does vary a little bit depending on where you're at. And I hesitate to give hard numbers, um, but I can say you know, the payments are, are, are pretty good. And I think they're a, a good hedge against uh, some of the ups and downs of commodity prices. Sure. Um, are there any um, restrictions on what you can do with the land when, uh, when you sign an option agreement with a solar developer? No, there's not really. You can pretty much carry on farming or ranching if that's what you're doing now. Uh, we, you know, we do need to get in there and do some surveys, wetland surveys, and um, towards the end, uh, geotech surveys. Uh, but that doesn't really restrict your uh, operations. Uh, you know, the one thing that we you know, can't have you do is do something to the land that would prevent us from building a solar project down the road. Right, so you can't go in and put a bunch of residential development on it that we can't take down. That would kind of defeat the whole purpose. Uh, but otherwise you pretty much carry on. Sure, no, that makes sense. Uh, could I still uh, sell the farm if something came up during that period where family wanted to sell? Yeah, you can sell it uh, provided the uh, solar lease agreement, the solar option agreement stays with the land. Uh, and we've had that happen before. That's not that unusual. Sure. Um, what factors are important in locating a potential solar farm area? Yeah, that's a big, that's a big important question. Uh, there's a few primary factors. Uh, the first one being proximity to the power grid. You need to be pretty close to a pretty big transmission line. I'm not talking about the distribution lines that run everywhere that feed your houses. I'm talking about the larger power lines. You need to be pretty close to that um, because fundamentally we need to send the power to the grid. Uh, the other things, one is it's got to be uh, a buildable land as in it can't be really steep land. Pretty much if you can farm it, we can build on it uh, and we can build on even steeper ground too. It takes a little bit more work and cost to do that. Um, the one exception is on floodplain. We we have a you know it's difficult to get insurance for a solar project when you're building in a floodplain. There are some exceptions, but it's uh, it's pretty challenging. So we we tend to um, have to exclude floodplain area uh, and wetlands and things like that. Uh, we won't be able to build in. And then, you know, the last thing is, uh, you know, sometimes there's sensitive species habitat or things like that that prevent us from building, but that usually doesn't come up too much with solar power. Sure. Uh, we've got a lot of different questions coming in, so we'll, we'll tackle a few of those. Yeah, let's go those. Um, one says, what happens to your solar lease if the inflation rates continue to double digit or worse, approach 20% as they did in 1979? Uh, the concern would be that the 2% accelerators would become moot at that point. Yeah, I mean, we've <laughs> certainly we uh, negotiate with landowners on that acceleration, uh, that escalation. So uh, we've, we've signed up different rates there, but you also have to keep in mind that, you know, inflation doesn't typically stay that high for that long. It also comes back down. Sometimes it goes zero or negative. Uh, and so that's, that's something to keep in mind. And the good news for, you know, if you do a solar lease, you're not, you're not um, sensitive to inflation of, of your input costs. You have no input costs as a landowner when, you, uh, when you're leasing the land for solar, right? You're just generating the revenue. So you're not exposed to inflation on that end. Sure. Um, so that's a key factor. 
Yeah. Now, typically, do you tend to place panels on the entire farm, or do you leave uh, different areas of the farm where that aren't developed? Um, and then, would you articulate that to the perspective prospective landowners? If you leave holes in the farm free of panels, do you compensate landowners at the same level of payment for those those particular spots? That's a great question. Uh, let me start by saying we always try to maximize our use of the land to, to build as much solar as possible when we're signing up a lease. And the reason for that is it, it, it's not economic for us to build little pieces here and there. Um, it's cheaper, it's more cost effective really to, to build the solar project in kind of a, a central group. If you're building a little bit here and then another five acres over there, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So if it's buildable, we will try to um, you know, locate it as close together as we can. Uh, there are uh, exceptions to that. You know, we, there may be permitting restrictions that say, well, we can't build all the way up to the property line, right? So we have to leave some of those gaps. And we work with landowners uh, to compensate them fairly for if we're not going to um, build on an area. Um, but generally speaking, we try to lease and build on as much as possible. Mm -hmm. and it, it, but it's a very site-specific question. Uh, I'm happy to get into that if you know, individuals have questions about their land. Sure, and that's probably the same as the next question. Do you have to move dirt or can you use the land as it is typically? Yeah, it varies. Um, we, we always try to use the land as it is. Um, you know, so if it's not too steep, uh, we'll build on it. And the technology is getting better and better. We're able to build on steeper and steeper land. But in order to, uh, you know, make use of some of those steeper slopes, say up, you know, around 15% or so, we we will have to move uh, move some earth uh, to be able to build on on that. But you know, the, the flatter sites, we don't really try to avoid that if we can. Sure. And do you allow alternative crops or grazing of, say, sheep once the panels are in place? Yeah, this is a an area that's, that's kind of expanding. Uh, sheep grazing has been a practice for a little while and, and we've seen more and more of that. And that tends to work pretty well. I mean, we need to keep the vegetation down anyway, right? So if, we don't, if we're not running sheep, we're, we're gonna need to get in there and cut the grasses to keep it down below the solar panels. So the sheep grazing is a, is a nice fit. Um, anything, you know, it's real hard to run cattle. Yeah, they're, they're a bit too big. Uh, and goats, as you know, eat everything. So there's sheep are kind of the ideal fit. There's not really much else that works. Um, sure. But as far as growing crops, you know, that's an area that's really being explored. Uh, there's some potential there to grow things between the rows. Um, and we're seeing more and more of that. Um, and we're open to, to trying things like that. You know, one of our sister companies, Belltown Farms, actually uh, in the farming business, and, and we've been talking with them about how, how we might try to do that. Um, so it, it's definitely something that, that as an industry is being looked at and something Belltown's very interested in. Sure, and then we have a, a couple questions uh, regarding the proximity to the grid. How, how close uh, do you have to be or how far away is too far? Yeah, there's no magic number there. Uh, depends a little bit on how many landowners you have in between you and the and, and the power and the power line and and uh, you know how how good you are how uh, how much of a good relationship you have with those neighbors to let us get an easement. Uh, but you you really need to be in most places less than five miles away and really you know a mile is is less than a mile is is kind of ideal. Uh, if you're beyond a mile, then we need to look at a number of factors like, okay, well, how we're going to get the transmission line, how we're going to get to connect to the transmission line, because we, ha we have to get the power there somewhere. We have to go through the neighbors and get easements and things, and that can be a challenge, and uh, not a lot of folks want to do that. Sure. Um, let's see here. How does solar compete with wind power since uh, they can still farm around the wind towers? Yeah, they're complementary in a lot of ways. Um, yeah, it's true you can you can farm around the the, the wind turbines pretty well, um, but a lot of folks, you know, wind turbines are big, as you know, 
uh, and increasingly a lot of folks don't want to see those. A lot of places have kind of had their fill with with uh, wind power and so solar power is just you know a lot lower to the ground. It's really difficult to see. It's not as big of a uh, you know big of a project in that manner. Uh, the other thing is solar panel. You know, solar produces power during the day. Wind is much more of a nighttime uh, producing power source, and so they're complementary in that way. And we're not going to be able to power the entire grid with wind power. We're not going to be able to power the entire grid with solar power. Uh, and so they ought to work together. And and we're increasingly starting to get into energy storage, and we haven't talked about that, no one, but that's something Belltown Power does as well, battery energy storage. And um, that'll help uh, smooth out the fluctuations in the solar and wind power. Sure. Um, and we've got a couple questions, and these are, I don't know, uh, bigger questions, big idea questions. Um, <laughs> Concerns about giving up farmland for food versus fuel. And then uh, another question was uh, around the same um, needing to double the need for food by uh, 2050 um, and the concern for solar projects taking too many prime acres out of production. So that might be, might be a question for you, might be a question for Howard, might be a combo. That might be a question for, yeah, that's a bigger bigger question isn't it um you know solar power is our business and and we think it's a it's a good idea uh it's how we make money and you know there's <clears throat> different ways of using the land i would say for my own part i think it is something we have to pay attention to you know we can't cover our entire uh farmland and in, in solar panels indefinitely um but i do think we have a lot of room um, and you know, Belltown, we're not just we're not just putting solar panels on prime farmland. We you know we're looking at uh, coal mines that that are old coal mines and and land that's you know less valuable for farming. Uh, we ideally we use as much of that as we can, and we we prioritize that if we can. But it's it's not always possible. Um, so me, it's a larger societal. To me, it's a larger, larger societal question about how we use our land. Um, I will say, you know, with solar panels, they're pretty easy to take out. So if for whatever reason we're like, you know, thirty years down the road, so we we got to have more land, um, you know, for for farming. You know, that's a question that we can we can figure that out. You can take solar panel out. At panels out and keep farming uh, after the, the solar project is done. So it's not like you're losing the land forever. You're not turning it into residential development that then um, will, you know, you'll never see it back. I mean, this is, and this is something we go through in, in our permitting processes. We're not, generally, we're not rezoning the land to something industrial or something that's um, residential or something like that. It stays ag. And when the solar is done, it goes back to egg. Sure. I don't Clint, know how I, to comment. Yeah, the, Clint, I, what I found interesting is in some of the counties, they've debated this issue. Well, if we allow this project to come in, it's going to take all this prime cropland. And for example, in the county where I live, Wabash County, Indiana, they were looking at a 2,000 acre project. Well, that honestly is, is like 2% of the cropland. And with the transmission lines that exist here, the planning commission kind of looked at those and said, uh, that's about all the solar development we can even have. Um, so it, it's one of those things where it seems like there's a lot, but when you put it in the overall scheme of things, it's not a big percentage. And the reality is you can't put solar panels across an entire county because the transmission lines and the capacity doesn't exist. So it's really a, a combining what capacity exists in the transmission lines and the points of interconnect, and then what lands available. Um, so I, I think you covered the rest of it well. Yeah, uh, that leads to another question. What happens with the solar equipment at the end of the lease? Yeah, so we, we have a requirement in our leases to decommission the project, remove all the solar equipment, all the lines, everything, and return the land back to, back to normal. Uh, and we typically then are, are, we're including a bond to pay for that restoration uh, in, you know, in the event that uh, Belltown 
isn't around in 40 years. Um, there's a bond that the landowner can draw on to, to get that taken care of. But we that's a very strict requirement. Um, more and more counties and local governments are requiring that, that uh, the solar companies have these, um, these decommissioning requirements, they're called, and, and, a, and a bond. So we, I think we'll continue to do that. It's standard in every one of our leases. Um, even if the county doesn't require it, we, we just think it's the right thing to do. Sure. Well, and, and I, we touched on some of this. A lot of people sent in, uh, why don't you put them in the desert instead of here? And I think a lot of that has to do with the, trans, the grid. Um, uh, there, there's not a whole lot that goes on in the desert. So uh, they're definitely yeah, big. They are. I mean, we're building them in the desert. All right, we, Belltown, we're not building so much in the desert. But there are a lot of projects going up in the desert. But yeah, as we talked about, you, you got to be able to get that power back across from the desert all the way out to, to this neck of the woods. That's that's a long way. That's uh, probably not going to happen. Sure. Um, and as far as the bond goes, we talked about that. Uh, how is it funded and and when does that get funded typically? Yeah, typically right at, uh, when you start the operation of the project and it and we fund it. The owner of the solar project funds it. We have to put up the cash for that and it stays funded the entire life of the project. Sure. Uh, how do you protect drain tile that is placed on the farms that you might lease for solar? We got a couple questions on that. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, we have, you know, we've done a couple of leases with with drain tiles. State of Illinois actually has a, uh, a state law that requires the developer to maintain, you know, e either if if there is going to be damage, they have to go back and fix them and, um, and maintain them. So there's a there's a requirement that um, at the state level that the developer has to go through. And that's typically something we try to address in a lease as well. Um, so, you know, put the burden back onto the solar developer to make sure that those are, um, you know, not destroyed. And if they, if there is any damage, they have to be uh, maintained. But it, it's something you gotta, you have to map them out. You have to do surveys to make sure you know where they're at exactly and not, not mess them up. Sure. And we're coming up on the end of the hour here, but we do have a lot of people still on and a lot of questions. So if it's Great. okay with everybody, we'll keep going. And if you have to jump off for another commitment, this will be recorded and we can get it out to you. Just send your email in the chat. But um, what, um, who is responsible for paying the new property taxes on the leased land? That would be us. Okay. Yeah. No, the solar developer takes all of that any any increase in property tax um, the solar developer um, is totally the solar developer's responsibility and that that's spelled out in the lease as well and then with that bond does it guarantee to pay the lease amount for the initial 20 to 30 year term of the lease no the the bond is for just for the decommissioning it's, okay. you know, so if if you if the solar developer doesn't pay the lease and continues well first thing that happens it's about like leasing any kind of lease really if first thing that happens is the bank will probably take it over right if if belltown for example were to go under the bank would step in and they would pay the lease and they would find a new owner for the solar project as long as that solar project's selling power to the grid and generating revenue, it's still valuable, right? So the bank is going to step in and and continue to pay the lease, and and the lease has to be paid, right? If the lease doesn't get paid, and this is spelled out in the the agreements, then the landowner basically assumes control of the project and can draw upon that bond to take it out. And Clint. You might uh, clarify in that five-year option period, you go out and negotiate a power purchase agreement. That's right. And does it not mirror the length of the lease? Typically, they're shorter than the full length of the lease to start with. Um, they'd be as short as 10 years, but can be 20, 25 years. Um, typically, they're around 10 to 15 years to start with. Uh, but then, you know, the thing about power is, 
as long as you, and, and solar power in particular, your operating costs are next to nothing, right? All the costs are in the actually building the project. There's very little work to do to maintain it. So, you know, once it's up and op operating, it doesn't really cost you to keep it going, right? So that first power purchase agreement, maybe it expires after 15 years, you go sign up a new one or you sell the power a merchant, you know, you sell it on a on the open market. And that actually is very cost, uh, you know, it's very effective. And because your, your, um, you know, cost to produce are next to nothing, you know, you can still make money and sell that power uh, at a low rate, as long as you made enough in those first 15 years to pay, pay off the cost, uh, you know, the capital cost. So that's a good question, Howard, and a good comment that, that, you know, you have a power purchase agreement and that is, you know, your source of revenue for at least the first 10 years. Sure. Um, are there any toxins uh, involved in the project that could potentially damage the land? No, I mean, there's, there's, the solar panels are solid, right? They're a hundred percent solid. There's, there's nothing, there's no liquid in them. Uh, there's nothing that can leak or anything like that. Uh, so they're, you know, they're very, you know, very uh, strong in that perspective that it's just, there's no, there's no release of toxins or chemicals or anything like that. Um, you know, there's, there's certainly some you know, elements in the panels themselves that are, you know, rare earth elements and things like that, that you need to be cautious of. You don't, you wouldn't want to go breaking, a, breaking apart the solar panels and uh, just putting it back in the earth. Uh, but, you know, when they're up, when they're sitting there up and running, uh, there's nothing leaking out of them or leaching into the ground. Sure. Um, what has been your experience with community pushback for solar development as compared to wind? Uh, you know, I've been in the renewable energy business, so wind and solar for about 20 years. Um, and there's, there's generally more pushback on wind than there is solar, and it varies a little bit. Um, and it, it really comes down to I think the size of a wind turbine versus a solar panel. You know, a wind turbine has moving parts and it, they aren't noisy. Um, you can hear them if you're right up next to them, but um, they're just bigger. Solar panels barely move. You know, they track the sun, but you would hardly even notice that. Um, and they really don't make any sound and then you can barely see them. So generally speaking, we've had pretty good support at the community level. Sure. Most often, you know, when we do have opposition, it frankly comes down to people just not wanting to see it. And I get it. You know, if you have a home next door, you don't necessarily want to see the solar panels. Um, but typically, if we do a good job and we're talking to all our neighbors and, um, you know, we've, we're working with landowners who are well respected in the community, then we, we don't have much problem getting it permitted. Sure. Uh, there's one here. Is there any problem with uh, bird droppings that anyone should worry about? Bird dropping? Yeah. As in the, the birds uh, soiling the panels? That, that could be it. Yeah. Um, you know, I've not heard of that as an issue. Typically, if there is, um, you know, in the more drier parts of the country, like in the desert, they will actually go out and clean the solar panels seasonally. Okay. So in theory, you could go, if, if you do get bird droppings, you could just go clean the panels, just like washing glass, basically. Um, I mean, most of solar panels, the, the surface is all glass. So you, you go out and wash them. Um, it's kind of a manual exercise. There are machines that do it. But, you know, most of the places in the Midwest, we don't need to do it. There's enough rainfall um throughout the year that it doesn't make sense to do it sure um and then follow up on drain tile um question revolves around footers foundation structural setup how deep do you go yeah so uh, how, how deep are the posts going in the ground and then the the wiring that you run underground how deep is that yeah i might i might turn to vanessa on this to to help me because she's gonna have more experience with this than me um, just in terms of the foundation, they're, they're posts generally. 
So we're not putting any concrete in the ground for the most part, uh, with the exception being the concrete pads where you have the, you know, the, the bigger electrical equipment like transformers, uh, but there's not very many of those. Um, the, the actual solar panels are, are held up by posts that, that are driven into the ground. And Vanessa, uh, you, you probably know better than me how deep those are, those posts typically, is it? Yeah, uh, pile embedment uh, doesn't go beyond eight feet. Uh, that's typically the max uh, where we need to embed the piles uh, for more uh, yeah, stronger hold. And the cabling, Vanessa, help me on this one too, it's usually about three feet? Yes, yeah, okay. typically, uh-huh. Great. Um, would it be economical to run four or five miles from a connection to the grid if you can acquire the needed easements to reach um, a large enough property? Um, or would there be a disadvantage to acquiring um, property near the connection? I think I could answer that. The closer you are, the better, obviously. But um, four to five miles, Clint, what does that look like for you guys? Yeah, it, it really depends on the nature of the project. We wouldn't run four to five miles to build a small project on say 400 acres. So the, the bigger the project you can do, then the easier it is to justify that longer um, length of, uh, of easement to get to the, the transmission line. And so I, I, I hesitate, you know, we're doing that out west where we can build some bigger projects out in drier land and lower value farmland. I think it gets a little harder uh, in the Midwest for the most part. And so we, you know, in the Midwest, we're typically looking at, you know, not longer than a mile. Okay. Um, I think that's the, the end of the questions that were turned into me and um, the end of that I see in the, in the chat here. But if anybody else has a few, we'll be on for a few minutes. Um, yeah, I might point out that uh, when we've been involved in some of the discussions about a solar lease, Clint, tell me if I'm wrong here, but basically you're driving posts in the ground. If I'm a landowner, my, my soil is not going to be disturbed. In fact, I think some people put that in the lease where you can't move the, the topsoil. So my land's not being moved. It's covered with grass. You might also address a pollinator habitat because I know sometimes you put in strips of bee habitat. So I'm not going to have any erosion. My fertility is going to stay the same. Whatever it was going in, it's going to be coming out. It, that, we're not putting any fertilizer down. So that's not going to change one way or the other. So less erosion, no fertility change. In theory, you were going to pull those posts straight out of the ground, so it shouldn't disrupt the soil a lot. I know some counties will not require the wiring underground to be removed below four feet um, because that's so disruptive to the tile and other things. Yeah. Uh, and in, you know, I also am aware of a county that required uh, trenching in versus plowing in uh, so they can actually seat tiles that are cut. So in general, I feel like it's not going to be real negative to my farmland. At, now, this is 40 years down the road when this comes out. Um, but odds are it's not going to be a lot different than what I got. In fact, it might even be a little bit better from an organic matter standpoint, right? No, I think you've nailed it. I think you've answered all the key points there. And I think, you know, especially as you look past you know, the land value, past, past the age of the solar project, that's going to be maintained. Uh, because of all the things you just said. I mean, the, it's very low intensity. Uh, it's pretty easy to install it and get in there and get out without disrupting the land much at all. And Clint, I, I'm guessing, because we had a question about uh, more efficient solar panels in the future, which is going to happen, right? Technology improvement. Yeah. Um, once a lease is in place, because those aren't as easy to get, and a permit's in place, and the infrastructure's there, I'm almost guessing that at the end of 25, 30 years, depending on the lease term, it probably gets renewed because of the challenges in setting all that up in the first place. And maybe new panels get installed by the developer that are more efficient at some point in time in that process. Am I thinking correctly here? No, I think you're right. I think that's definite possibility. Um, you, can't, you can't go in and fundamentally change the nature of the technology right? One, it's not permitted for that. So I couldn't go in and then 
build a wind farm for a project that's permitted for solar, right? You know, that wouldn't make sense. But, but absolutely, I think um, there will be continued improvements in the efficiency of solar, and it may make sense in 20 years to replace the solar panels. Um, they do last a long time. I mean, they're very durable products. They last a very long time. And we've seen this. I mean, there are some older projects out there that are still running. Um, so they can last uh, a very long time. But if, they're, if it does make sense to replace them, uh, then, we, then we could do that. Sure. And Clint, I've had several people reach out asking for your phone number, and I've directed them to send, or I'll send them an email. I've got all their email addresses, and then I can forward your contact information in that way. So if there's anybody else. Lease termination. Yes. Uh, is it common that these leases, that the tenant can terminate it at any time, even within the original 20 or 30 year initial term of lease, but the landowner is committed to the initial term plus any possible option terms of extension contained in the lease? Uh, well, now we're getting into some real specifics of the lease. Uh, that's a good question. Um, and I don't have the, the, the exact answer for that. There are, um, there are allowances for the tenant to exit the lease, um, but they're very, they're very specific. That's something that's also negotiated to in the lease. So I, I'm happy to discuss that in more detail with someone if they, if they want to really get into the weeds on that. Sure. Um, I will uh, see if I can get her. Clint, what's the smallest size project you would do? If you got a transmission line or a point of interconnect right there, how small a project might you do? Well, it varies from, you know, from state to state a little bit. There's some states have incentives to do real small projects, like, you know, 10 acre type of things. Um, we're typically looking at 400 <laughs> acres and up. Um, and that's that's pretty common for um, you know, utility scale solar developments, the type of development we're doing. Now, that's not all with one landowner. Typically, um, you know, we'll get a few neighbors together. Uh, but yeah, usually we're looking for 400 acres and higher uh, before we consider it a, a good economic project for us. Perfect. Well, that, that looks like all the questions that I have and. Um, you know, if, if you have a question beyond this, uh, after we're done today, we're actually 10 minutes over now, uh, feel free to reach us out to us at Halderman and we can get you in touch with uh, our solar partners or if you have a land question, get a hold of us. But um, I think with that, Clint, we really appreciate you coming on and explaining a little more from the developer side of things and appreciate everybody joining us today. Uh, like I said, feel free to reach out to us at Halderman with any questions and we'll point you in the right direction. Thank you, everybody, so much. Thank you, Clint. Good. Thank you. Thanks, um, Howard. Thanks, Nolan.